Atheist Nomads, episode 120, news for November 12, 2015. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And joining us once again is my lovely wife, Lauren Studley, back from the grave of a migraine. Yes, I am trying so hard to not talk like a robot right now, but I promised. Hi, everyone. She's been on the show enough now that I got her a actual proper boom mic stand with a suspension shock mount and studio headphones. The headphones make me look like a robot. Yeah. Is the boom made of metal? The boom is all up in here. <laughs> all right, that's enough robot talking. Ah, oh, come on. Uh, now we've... <laughs> People demand it. No, no, they don't. Okay. Uh, we got a, a post on our Facebook page about the disclaimer before the intro. Yay, input. And this is from Pat Miller. <laughs> Despite your warnings at the start of each episode, there seems to actually be very little talking about hoo Now, we had created that to replace the really, really long one that Paul from Coronify Me did uh, when we recorded with him and a bunch of other podcasters when I was last in the Puget Sound. And uh, that was because he'd complained about his daughter getting to listen to a <laughs> discussion about, as I recall, it was... A lot of oral stuff in that region. And, hey, no, uh, in the region that. of hoo Yeah. And around the other side. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That's all right. Some, some people like the black door play. It's all right. And so <laughs> we, we've worked out a few other options. And uh, we're going to put this up to a, a vote. Uh, if you want to get logged in with the vote, uh, email us at contact at atheistnomads.com and tell us what you want. Um, option number one is the, the current existing one. With the, the hoo-hahs. Hoo-hahs. Downside of that one, of course, is that we don't actually talk about hoo-hahs that often. Hoo-hahs. So it ends up being, you know, a little bit misleading and might get people's hopes up. Hoo-hahs. So we've got option number two. That is true. It did get my hopes up. <laughs> option number two. The podcast you're about to listen to has an explicit tag for a goddamn reason. Please be advised. Option three. The podcast you're about to listen to covers topics that may not be appropriate for children or Dustin's parents. Please be advised. Hi, Mom. One nice thing with that one is my parents apparently do listen, so... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and then option number four. The podcast you're about to listen to may not be appropriate for all audiences. If you fit in that category, kindly fuck off. Please be advised. So send us an email. Contact atheistnomads.com with... Your choice between options one, two, three, and four, and these will also be able to be found on the show notes at atheistnomads.com slash 120. Might I also suggest, you know, if you think of something better, go ahead and email those suggestions or post them to the Facebooks. All right, and now we're going to move into our, our special topic for today. Uh, we're going to be talking about Adventists and science. This is a... One that's been brought up into the news, uh, thanks to Ben Carson, uh, presidential candidate, current Republican frontrunner, famed, like, absolutely amazing neurosurgeon, and Seventh-day Adventist. So to put this in some context, and I've mentioned this first little bit maybe a few times before, there are 18.1 million Adventists around the world, and approximately 1 million in the U.S. There are 175 hospitals owned by the Adventist Church around the world, 136 nursing homes, 5,714 primary schools, 1,969 secondary schools, 113 colleges, university, and trade schools, including at least 10 in the U.S. They have their own medical school, Loma Linda University Medical School, and there may be some elsewhere in the world, but Loma Linda is the one that's important. And the church also has a department within the General Conference called the Biblical Research Institute. They exist to do theological study, apologetic research, and one of their, their big tasks throughout the years has been to support creationism. 
uh, the Adventist Church is very big on creationism. Uh, recently, uh, I believe this was last year, the General Conference president, so the head of the, the World Church, was at a conference and said that anybody who works for the Adventist Church who accepts evolution should be fired. Nice. To put this in some context, every Adventist college has science programs. Some of them have rather large science programs. My own alma mater, Walla Walla, had a, a I think their, uh, it was like the third largest major was biology. Uh, most of those biology students were going on to medical school. Well, about half were. The other half were uh, going to be going more the academic route. Uh, but there's a lot of biology programs. And I happen to know at pretty much every Adventist college, they teach evolution in the biology classes. You can't teach biology without evolution. But you can't ignore it. Now, there are some professors who would probably say, this is not what the church believes, or this is not what I believe, but they do cover it. In Adventist high schools, they sometimes cover it. Mine did not. Uh, my teacher skipped it and uh, moved on to the next chapter in our state-mandated textbook. She went to, to high school with my mom and at Jim State Academy in Idaho in the 1960s. They did teach evolution. They said that this is wrong. We don't believe this, but they taught it. And what you end up having is a whole bunch of people with a whole lot of cognitive dissonance. And this is something that at least when you go through the Adventist educational system, you have people explaining to you how to navigate that dissonance. So you have assistance in figuring out how to balance what you're learning is scientific fact versus what you believe when they are in complete opposition. In the case of, of uh, Carson, he went to secular schools all the way through. So he didn't get that Adventist education where they were telling him, this is what science thinks, this is what we believe. And he got to go through the cognitive dissonance on his own. And uh, I, I kind of have a feeling that might be part of why he's having such a, whole, a hard time talking about reality. Uh, now, there also is just the some other weird balancing between reality and, and theology that Adventists do. They are quite skeptical as far as most things go, except for creationism and, you know, a handful of other pet things, like any uh, kind of, of spiritual stuff going on. They are very skeptical of that, any claims like that. They are highly skeptical of any kind of a ghost story. They are, in the least in the U.S., skeptical of anything involving claims of demonic possession. Out in the mission field, they have a very different view where they will actually treat mental illness with exorcisms. Kind of sad that they do that, but yeah, you know, that's that's what they do. You you they they try to balance uh, the two and. Uh, it is very difficult to be a skeptic who believes in, in fairy tales. But they can be a skeptic that believes in exorcisms. <laughs> Again, fairy tales. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's, it, they, they try to balance it as well as they can. Uh, they try to draw on science as much as they can, as long as it fits with what they believe. Uh, we do have a story coming up where the Adventist Church, looking at the science, has basically reworded, well, changed some of their beliefs, or at least guidance on how to believe and act, while not actually changing anything. And so, it's just an interesting thing to keep in mind, especially with Ben Carson. That guy. Uh, not that guy. Oh, man. Holy shit. Did you know that the Colosseum was actually a dinosaur pen? That's where they kept their pet T-Rexes. That's right. I mean, the guy's a brilliant neurosurgeon. There's no doubt about that. He's just a dope. Mm -hmm. And everybody is allowed to be a dope in their own way. They just don't have any right running for president. All right. We're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with history. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey. 
We're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. This day in history, November 12th, starting with the year 1934. Charles Manson, the American cult leader and murderer, was born. Uh, so everybody knows the, the dude that has the crazy eyes and the swastika on his forehead. Yeah, he was born today. Moving on along. <laughs> <laughs> Making fun of him is an American pastime. It really is. Nothing really needs to be said about, you know, crazy eyes. Moving on along. This day in history, the year is 1954. And this one is kind of sad. I didn't even know this was a, the, a thing. Ellis Island closes. I, you know, I actually kind of thought that Ellis Island was still open and like welcoming people, but I guess not. But uh, it's just a museum at this point. Yeah, there's part of me that knew that it wasn't running anymore, but at the same time, I was not aware of it closing. Like they didn't, I never officially closed. Yeah. Back in 54. I mean, not even like Kennedy wasn't even the president yet. Fuck. But uh, yeah, so uh, Ellis Island totally like it was the gateway to America. You know, it processed over 12 million immigrants since opening in 1892. And Supposedly, about 40% of all Americans can trace their roots through Ellis Island at some point in time, which is fucking crazy. <clears throat> it's like I all can't. those genealogy people who are obsessed with tracking themselves to the Mayflower. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I can trace an ancestor back to the Mayflower. <laughs> yes, you have ancestors on the Mayflower. One. One. One ancestor. And they ended up in Jersey. Yeah. <laughs> yes um ellis island famous also for the fact that they didn't turn very many people away well i mean if you made it on the boat yeah they're probably not gonna kick you back well probably not but i mean they nowadays they turn people away all the time <laughs> <laughs> but, oh. uh, no something like what two three percent that ever got turned away it was That's pretty cool bad. wow uh, in world war one it was a, a enemy detention center <laughs> Welcome to America. So yeah, the hospital they, for wounded soldiers in World War II. And they processed their first person on January 2nd, 1892. The first was a 15-year-old girl named Annie Moore. She was from Ireland. Uh, <clears throat> I bet her family is proud. I bet her family's dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> all right. We'll just move it on, move it on along here. To more hilarious <laughs> stories. Oh yeah, th this this one is just explosively funny. That's the best I got for that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So this day in history, 1970, the Oregon Highway Division attempts to destroy a rotting beach sperm whale with explosives, uh, leading to the now infamous exploding whale incident. Yeah, <laughs> and this is as bad as it sounds, everybody. Sperm, uh, <laughs> sperm everywhere. Eight tons of sperm. Holy shit. <clears throat> November 12th, a 45 foot long, uh, eight ton sperm whale beach itself in Florence, Oregon, uh, which, you know, coastal city and, you know, anyways, sand dunes. Where, sand dunes. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm sure we have like some non American listeners, and I'm sure that a lot of our American listeners don't know where Oregon is either. So fuck it. Um, and, and to explain why the it was the highway division that did this, uh, the beach is an Oregon State Highway. Hmm. <laughs> that is awesome. <laughs> uh, so you can legally drive anywhere that it's not explicitly forbidden or impossible. Just run over that whale. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so uh, they got a half a ton of dynamite, uh, attached it to the carcass, and uh, you had sperm whale flying over 800 feet in the air in all directions so ew that would have smelled so bad <laughs> i mean it, it already smelled bad i mean i would have <laughs> i would have paid good money to go see that though he's <laughs> like yep i got some of the famous exploding whale on me here i got the oil I got the oil stain here on my shirt <laughs> that it's the navy told them to Try handling it the, the same as they would a boulder. <laughs> that was stupid. 
organic matter is messy, not like a boulder, which is shrapnelly and still not a great idea. Yeah, but then, you know, scavengers could come clean it up. <laughs> well, there was actually a, a military uh, person that had explosives training that, you know, had heard about what was going to go on. And when he heard that 20 cases were being used, he was in complete disbelief, of course. <laughs> you know, like 20 sticks, maybe, but not 20 cases. Can you imagine the highway district? They were like, oh my god, yes, pull pull all strings. Let's get as much dynamite in here as possible, guys. We're never going to be allowed to do this again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this is something where off. somebody said, hold my beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is great. Oh, never forget. <laughs> uh, Exploding so, yeah, sperm whale. The resulting explosion was caught on film and... Uh, an actual like a a, a a popular political comic of the time you know just turned this into the exploding whale thing and it just you know it be, it became like newspaper famous for quite a while you know before you had internet famous but luckily you can still go to the youtubes and find this video so and i really suggest you do oh wow <laughs> <laughs> you know and yeah. i said that the uh, beach is an oregon or state highway that's not the case anymore and the beaches are now run by the parks department and they bury whales and if they can't bury them where they're at they move them to another beach and bury them <laughs> you think they could just like push them back in let them float off uh, they just keep washing back up whales float yeah but okay fine like shoot a stick of dynamite into its tummy <laughs> and then like you know push it out let it float and then re remote detonate it when it's like you know 50 feet out or something oh my god that would be so much fun too <laughs> there were so many good ways to end this they just chose one of the good ways they chose the best way they chose the best way it was the most accessible to the public because everything <laughs> within 800 feet got sprayed it's With like sperm. sea world gone horribly horribly wrong <laughs> that is not the splash zone you want to be in <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well yeah nobody want well Actually, I suppose some people do want sperm on their face, but that's a different story. Hi, Dustin's mom and dad. <laughs> uh, yeah, so moving on along. Moving on along. Yeah, from one stupid thing done in Oregon to a stupid it's just person a stupid from Oregon. Person. Yeah. And this is getting a, a drive-by also. This day in history, 1970. Tanya Harding, the American figure skater, is born. So... Everybody remembers the blonde non-bombshell that uh, knocked Nancy Kerrigan in the kneecap. Well, actually paid somebody else to do it, but yeah, still. Whose boyfriend knocked her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> she was a really good figure skater. I actually got to see her. Oh, no doubt. Just I practicing mean, once. And at, at uh, one of the malls in Portland, I don't remember which one it is exactly, but it has a uh, skating rink inside. Well, she was like really poor and she actually ended up having to to practice in the mall all the time that was mm -hmm. that was kind of her her practice field excuse me her practice field uh kerrigan on the other hand the silver spoon kind of girl always had her her private uh lessons and all that but you know if somebody's olympic quality or at least contending to go to, to the olympics of course they're going to be good mm -hmm. so no doubt i'm sure she was pretty fucking good <laughs> oh yeah Anyways, um, yeah, let's keep going. Blah, 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 blah. This day in history, 1993, the first UFC fighting championship, UFC 1, is held in Denver. Uh, so yeah, this uh, later became known as the beginning. Oh, yeah, I think you can actually track the degradation of American society back to that date. <laughs> I, yeah, that's uh, pretty close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, early days of pay-per-view and all that. Yeah. Um, boy, this, that is actually when the, the Gracie's started getting known for their fighting skill. And they're, they're the ones that brought MMA to you mainstream America, I would say. But, uh, yeah. Anyways, uh, I got nothing really good to say about it, but hooray octagon. It happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a thing. Two men it's enter, one man leave. <laughs> <laughs> People beating the, beating the shit out of each other on camera is a thing, unfortunately. Master Blaster runs Barter Town. Uh, <laughs> All right, the next one's better. Go to the next one. All right. 
this is not my robot voice. This day in history, the year is 2014. The Phil A. Lander deployed from the European Space Agency's Rosetta probe and soft lands on the surface of Comet 67P Chernyamov Chernyamenko. I nailed that shit. <laughs> nailed it. Yeah, nailed when it. I reported on this a year ago, I just called it 67P. I, I went full, like... Chernyamov Gerasimenko. You're off by a mile. Totally. Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> awesome! Yay, I remember that happening! Yeah, um... It was a year ago! Already a year, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it landed on the the wrong side of the, of the of the comet, so it had to operate on battery power as long as it could. And yeah, unfortunately, no sunlight for now. So maybe the comet will rotate in some some day, and we'll start getting signals again. But well, it, it was back up from June thirteen to July nine. Yeah, no, it totally got some usable data, which was cool, but uh. Yeah, for for now. I mean, when I think about the mathematical calculations that they have to do to get something out of orbit in a direction and then soft landing on something, how did they mess up the side of the comet? <laughs> like, I, yeah, that, that is was, like two two bullets. You had one job, Jerry. Other. One job. <laughs> the sunny side. You got like two bullets hitting each other at you know thousands and thousands of miles. Uh, uh, per hour yeah in two different directions which you know also give them credit for actually doing it in the first place because that's exactly exactly what it is it's shooting two bullets in air and managing to hit but come on jerry (laughs) (laughs) drop the ball but yeah you know what i'll give them a pass i mean at least they didn't like crash it into it like they have with other you know probes yeah we got some super creepy spooky looking pictures out of it too so uh yeah some of the goals of the mission focused on elemental isotopic molecular and mineralogical composition of the cometary material and yeah that most of that pretty much just didn't happen but yeah we got some cool pictures it's all about the selfie (laughs) (laughs) even in science that's really all there is to it and we don't have much until they until the comet rotates okay all right we're gonna take another quick break and then we'll be back with science we love hearing from our listeners you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com tweet us at atheistnomads send us a message on our facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads or better yet call us and leave us a message at 541-203 0666 we might even play it on the show you can also help us out by leaving us a review on itunes stitcher or your podcast directory of choice hey friends this is callie wright from the gatheist manifesto podcast your source for news commentary discussion and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the lgbt rights movement I'm sure I don't have to explain to you that there are many atheists and many members of the LGBT community who don't have a family gathering to go to on Thanksgiving. We are often uninvited, or at the very least made to feel unwelcome by our families because of who we are, who we love, or our lack of belief. If you don't otherwise have a place to go the evening of Thanksgiving this year, please consider joining us for a special live show the evening of Thanksgiving from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll be joined by special guests, including J.T. Everhard and David Smalley, and we'll be taking your calls, tweets, and emails about your family experiences, and just hanging out and having a good time with our family here. You have a community out here that cares about you. Come hang out with us. Find out more at facebook.com slash Manifesto. If that had Sarah McLaughlin playing in the background, I would have cried. And, and, and then you would have... Uh probably like supported the, the cats and dogs <laughs> yeah it's like i will make you turkey <laughs> come eat my pie no <gasps> careful lauren we're, hey we're not talking about who has Hoo-haws! okay <laughs> <laughs> speaking of not talking about who has science and technology because who has are not mentioned in this particular time so this week is a cancer triple header we've got one of the most interesting examples of parasitic disease immunity conflicts that has ever been known to happen there was a 41 year old colombian man who was diagnosed with hiv 10 years ago 
He has not been taking medication. He started feeling ill, so he went to his doctor. Um, he shows up with fever, cough, weight loss. This is all at, very typical of, of HIV AIDS. So when that happens, you check everything because when, once the immune system starts going, anything can happen. They did a CT scan and they found tumors in his lungs and his lymph nodes. But when they were looking at the cells that they pulled out of the tumorous regions, the cells were tiny, like super tiny, like 10 times smaller than a typical human cell. This is weird. This is, that is really weird. So they ran a couple tests, did a DNA test, and found that it actually matched up with the H. Nana tapeworm. They checked, the guy had a tapeworm. Because the tapeworm was in basically an already immuno uh, compromise the system. It's basically like a super parasite. And from what I read, it probably l- lived a little bit longer than normal parasites do. And it got cancer. Poor little thing. Aww. But then it metastasized and the cancer spread from the parasite to the host. <laughs> and this guy li- literally had little teeny tiny tumors all over his body. Um, when they finally figured out what happened, he, uh, he died about 72 hours after they found out it was the tapeworm. Unfortunately, because he was HIV uh, positive, there was probably no way that they could have prevented it or um, cured it. With uh, typical tapeworm fixing medications, it probably would have killed him because of his HIV status. Um, I do not suggest you do what Dustin's brother does and drink a whole bottle of tequila. (laughs) It was whiskey. A whiskey to kill the tapeworm. Um, I don't think anybody would have been able to survive that. I don't know how the man survived that. Certainly an HIV pers- positive person well, probably would have enjoyed that more than... A bottle of whiskey's not that bad. <sighs> yeah. Depends on the brother. whiskey. <laughs> Depends on the whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but it did give them a whole new area of research into tapeworms, how they affect hosts, especially if those hosts are immunocompromised. So hopefully they'll be able to come up with some interesting uh, treatments from that. The second cancer news. I'm sorry. I just have to say that getting tapeworm cancer is gross. Even worse than just having a tapeworm. I know, but as a microbiologist's point of view, those cancer cells would have been so cute. <laughs> but it's, right. it's so crazy. It's like seriously like triple kicking somebody when they're down. Right? Yeah. <laughs> He's got HIV. He gets a tapeworm and it gives him freaking cancer. Yeah. That is nuts. Teeny tiny little cancer. <laughs> Um, yeah, metastasizing. Oh, man. Got yeah. into the lymph nodes, got into the lungs. And tapeworms are so common in areas where HIV is just going out of control without uh, appropriate treatment, typically. Africa. Africa, parts of Latin America, uh, et cetera. So this probably happens frequently. This is just the, well, not rare but it probably happens this is probably just the first time it's ever actually been identified and made it into an actual article journal yeah Um, Yeah. i'm sure people have looked at the cell cancer uh cells before and they're like well that's weird but just wrote it off as something weird never thinking wow that's weird let's do a dna test on it i mean who would have even thought of that the second article we have today is the one that i am most excited about uh this was just recently um Brought to news, Uh, Dustin here went back to the CTV News article, uh, which is a Canadian news agency, and Dr. Mainprize is a researcher, head researcher at Sunnybrook Health Science Center in Canada, who was working on a malignant glioma, and um, for those of you not in the know, glioma is a type of uh, cancer that affects the brain cells, all right, so basically impossible to treat because there's this protective saran wrap like barrier called the blood brain barrier um nothing gets through it uh they have to usually surgically go into the brain and that is incredibly dangerous and not worth the risk most of the time especially with a glia which it spreads out like a web throughout the brain so you can't cut away enough of it to do anything without killing the person. Exactly. Whenever you see pictures of neurons creating like a huge web, that's what, they're, that's what they are talking about. So the way this works is they, they inject the patient with the chemotherapy, and then they inject them with these uh, harm, harmless gas microbubbles. And then once they see that that has all gotten to where the tumor is, they sh- hit it with a very high-powered, very highly directed ultrasound. 
this excites the bubbles, so they start vibrating really fast, and that just shreds the blood-brain barrier, allowing the medication to pass, which it did. They, they had uh, chemical markers on the medicine, so they were able to actually see it going into the tumor. So um, this is the first time in, in your history that they've been able to get past the blood-brain barrier. Uh, within 12 hours, the blood-brain barrier recovers, and um, later that day, they can do surgery and remove the bulk of the tumor and uh, see how much of the medicine actually made it through. As of right now, there are nine more patients on the docket to get this treatment, and um, they will publish results, and we're hoping that this is going to be a brand new turnover in uh, brain medicine. Yeah. There's also a uh, breast cancer researcher at Sunnybrook that is interested in using this for some of her patients who have a particular type of breast cancer that metastasizes into the brain. Very cool. Mm. And finally, on our last little cancer extravaganza here, we are going to talk about GMOs, (laughs) kind of. (laughs) Um, There was a girl who's recently been cured of leukemia by genetically modified T-cells. So, helper T cells, really? Yes, she was uh, not helper T's, uh, T killers. Oh, T killer cells. Uh, killers. Um, she was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia when she was three months old. Uh, the conventional treatment of chemo and bone, bone marrow transplants was tried, and that didn't work. Um, no surprise, really. In, in children that young, their bodies are pretty much remaking themselves on a daily basis. <laughs> The doctors told the parents there was nothing more that they could do, but the parents were very insistent to try and save their little girl, obviously. Um, there was a doctor called Wasim, Kas- Wasim Kasim. That's really fun to say. Um, <laughs> the doctors contacted Wasim Kasim from University College London, who had been developing uh, gene therapy involving modified donor T cells. So those are the killer, you know, the killer cells. No. What they did was they edited the donor T cell with a addition. Um, this was for to target the CD19 antigen, and that's something that has been done before. And for the first time in this context, they did a gene deletion. They disabled the gene that would make the donor cell identify the recipient's cells as non-self and cause it to attack them. And the other normal problem would be that the patient's immune cells would destroy the donor T cells. But for leukemia patients, they are already on medication to wipe out their immune systems. However, one of these medications is an antibody that looks for T cells, like the donor cells. So a second gene was disabled in the donor cell to make it invisible to the antibody. With this much editing, it would look for the cancer, be invisible to the medication and the patient's immune system, and only look for the cancer. So this is some very, very precise editing that they did. Um, At this point, they had only been tested in mice, but because it seemed to be um, working so well, they gave approval to give it to Layla, the little girl. Three months later, the cancer was gone and she was in remission. Pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, they won't know for another year or two if it's an actual cure, but so far so good. Yeah, and for for a, a patient that young, you know, every every day is is awesome, right? So mm-hmm. <laughs> if they give her an extra couple of years, that is going to be amazing. All right, and we're going to take another break, and then we will be back with politics and religion. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. All right, Lauren's headache's coming back, so she isn't going to be with us for the rest of the show. Oh, shit. Okay. All right. First off, we have an update on Coach Joe Kennedy. Wesley, do you want to take this one? Okay. So, goodness, yes. Uh, Assistant Coach Joe Kennedy is uh, now suspended, and he has been for, well, a while now. This is awesome news, first of all. Uh, And go figure, you know, it only took Joe and our our lovely friends over at the uh, uh, Seattle Satanists uh, t- 
to help teach, you know, Christians separation of church and state. Uh, yeah, I, I've actually met some really great people and, um, I think I might actually be a Satanist now, so I don't know if I'm actually supposed to be on the show anymore. Ooh. Um, <laughs> ooh. But, uh, yeah, I got officially welcomed. That's kind of cool. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Littlest Star and friend of the show, Paul Case. Um, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, some amazing people over from the, uh, uh, Seattle, uh, Seattle Satanic Temple. Uh, they set up a meet and came to one of the last games. And boy, oh boy, was that a interesting night. <laughs> uh, holy shit. Yeah. So I actually led them up to the field, up to the ticket box where, um, they weren't actually allowed in, but, um, uh, it got crazy. Uh, of course, lots of people were watching along the fence as, you know, we were all walking up there and it was weird how, how crazy the kids got. I don't know. It just seemed like a, a very large group think just this weird amalgam of, of kids that were just like shaking the fence and shouting and Jesusing. And it, it was actually kind of scary. I mean, mm. you know, granted, most of them are like four foot tall or something. They're like mm-hmm. tiny kids. And I'm sure I could have taken like five or six down before they took me out. But, you know, I don't want to be the one kicking a, a four foot tall kid because, yeah, whatever. Anyways. Um, <laughs> it was actually a little scary and, uh, some of the members that were there were actually a little, a little taken aback by the reaction that they got. Uh, but anyways, yeah, uh, thankfully Joe was never let on the field, even though he did pray at the bottom of the stands and all of us got out of there safely. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the cops were actually the only thing they did was keep people from going in or out of the gate. I, uh, that's what I'm told, but I never actually saw them. Hmm. Some of the kids that were trying to get out to meet the Satanists were actually, actually attacked by other students. Uh, a couple of them threw rocks. Some of them threw water bottles at the kids. Holy crap. And, uh, yeah, it was, you know, this is what I'm hearing later and watching later because video was taken of this. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, weird just to, just to think of all the shit that was going on. But like I said, I didn't see a, a police presence out there. I just later heard that, you know, people weren't being allowed in or out. But, um, yeah. So <laughs> I see this massive, you know, 60, 70 plus kids, I suppose that are just, you know, causing a ruckus really it was yeah it was a little weird a little um uh, otherworldly i suppose I, I didn't expect something like that from my town <laughs> wow um uh, but anyways yeah uh joe has been suspended uh so far as i know he is he is still thinking about suing the school district with help from a attorney slash pr firm out of texas and yeah goodness He's yeah. He just was on a Bill O'Reilly show a couple of days ago too. That that went uh, well. It went poorly, really. I mean, the guy. So uh, is this going to be another case of somebody getting fired for refusing to do their job right, and then making buco bucks on the conservative uh, talk circuit? I don't know if he is, but I know that like a uh, the that there's a lot of people that will make some, a lot of money off of this. Uh, the way I understand it, he gets a stipend like the other coaches do. So it's really not that much money compared to what he earns at his regular job. Ah, so, you know, yeah, this, this really doesn't affect his lifestyle one way or the other. So there's no GoFundMe yet. No, um, cakes or pies or photography kind of look alike uh, thing yet, but, who knows? There might be pretty soon. <laughs> All right, man. Yeah. Well, so I, I weep for my town a bit, uh, yeah. but, uh, in a couple days on Thursday, the 12th, me and a, a quite a few other people are going to speak at the Burlington school district hmm. and we're going to give a, a quick one liner about, you know, we need a, a good definite, a, we need a coach in there that isn't going to do this. 
you know, if it's him, great. If it's not, great too. But uh, our main points are going to focus on uh, secular education, uh, anti-bullying campaigns, and to, you know, make everybody feel safe as much as possible. And get a fucking good education. Yeah, that's important. <laughs> yeah, well, keep us up to date on what happens with this story. Okie dokie. It's kind of uh, unique for us to have a, uh, no, one of us to have a personal in on a story. Yeah, yeah, totally. If you want some fun, Google up Coach Joe Kennedy Wesley Bonetti. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll get way too much shit. That's what I got. All right. All right. And for another update, uh, surprise, surprise, Opal Covey lost for the fifth time running for Toledo mayor. No, now, she didn't. She yep. won. Well, <laughs> she thinks she didn't, even though she came in last place. Dead but let's last. listen to her response to the election results. And I edited, edited this a lot, including the part where she speaks in tongues to get confirmation on a question about sports. So just have the, the more important thing she said. Last night, uh, election, I actually won again, but the, uh, the votes were stolen. Matter of fact, they weren't even stolen. I'm going to be mayor. But this was another attack from the devil to stop me. I've already had four big attacks, but I stand firm just like Moses did, and we're going to win. And I'm here to tell them on my last remarks, you're not going to defeat God. I'm going to stay here until it happens, and I'm going to be your mayor, whether you like it or not, because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I have sent, been sent by God all Almighty and his word has has told me that I'm going to be mayor, going to set these captives free. We're going to have a nice city and we're going to have a prosperous city and we're not going to go down like you have taken us down all of these years, thus saith the Lord. What the fuck captives are is she talking about? They're captives of the Democrats. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Captives of the Democrats um she thinks she's Moses. Well, she's comparing herself to Moses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Man, yeah. he's going to be mayor whether people like it or not. That's that's scary. That's scary. You know, <laughs> sure, she came in dead last. I think I made this point last time when we talked about her. Some people still voted for her. Mm -hmm. You know, those are some people that need to be put on a watch list or some shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she came in dead last at... With 494 votes. Holy shit. She doubled, like over doubled her last year, last times. Wow. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that, that's nuts. <laughs> and uh, speaking of nuts, Ooh. Ben Carson is now pulling ahead of Donald Trump in most polls for the GOP presidential nomination. He's also gotten a lot of flack lately from the media, unearthing some of his claims. These include, he's a creationist and believes that evolution is a deception from the devil. That's just part of being a good Adventist. He believes the pyramids in Egypt were built at Joseph's command to store grain, which he first espoused that publicly at the commencement address at Andrews University, home of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. Yeah, that was years ago, wasn't that it? That was 1998. Fuck. He claimed to have been offered a full-ride scholarship to West Point. Uh, which doesn't charge. They actually pay you. Uh huh. Yeah. So a full ride scholarship doesn't make sense at all in that that context, and <laughs> they also have no record of him ever applying. Oh, nice! I didn't even hear about that part. Yeah, yeah. And oh man, I saw another thing today with some of the crazy stuff that he has has said. Uh, what I thought was the funniest was his claim that none of the signers of the Declaration of Independence had ever been elected to public office. Okay. Most of them were members of their colonial assemblies, and whether they were elected to the assembly or not, they were sent, you know, selected by those assemblies to go to the Continental Congress. So that's just a straight up weird thing to say. Really weird thing to say. And uh, anyway, he's now going on the offensive. Here's some of the audio, and I, I did have to cut this down for length as well. Uh, he got kind of repet repetitive at times. You just said, you just told me that you got a scholarship on. You just said that. No, she said that I got a scholarship. I never said I got a scholarship. I do not remember 
this level of scrutiny for one President Barack Obama when he was running. In fact, I remember just the opposite. I remember people just, oh, well, we won't really talk about that. We won't talk about that relationship. Well, Frank Marshall Davis, well, we don't want to talk about that. Uh, Bernadine Dorn, Bill Ayers, oh, you know, he didn't really know him. You know, all the things that Jeremiah Wright was saying, oh, not a big problem. Goes to, to Occidental College, doesn't do all that well, and somehow ends up at Columbia University. Well, I don't know. His records are sealed. Why is his records sealed? Why are you guys not interested in why his records are sealed? Now, you're saying that something that happened with the words a scholarship was offered is a big deal, but the President of the United States, his academic records being sealed is not. Well, you're tell you're me, wait a minute. Tell me how. Tell me how there. Tell me how there's equivalency there. <laughs> right. He's <laughs> he's insane. So, I mean, the, <laughs> yeah. Nobody talked about Jeremiah Wright. Bullshit. Everybody talked about Jeremiah Wright for like a week. Yeah. Just like every topic. Uh oh. And who forget? Who can forget the fucking birth certificate? The birthers. I mean, that shit went on for years. It's still going on. Yeah, all of these these things that he, nobody, these Obama no, nobody. conspiracy theories, they all got a lot of attention in the media, and they all died because they were non-issues. Non-issues and not true, mm -hmm. from what I remember. Whereas oh, the case goodness. with Ben Carson, this is stuff in print, stuff there is video of him saying it. These are things that he still claims... <laughs> to be facts and he, cl he claimed that the pyramids were hermetically sealed that they were so perfectly airtight nothing was getting in or out which would, of course made them great grain silos uh-huh hermetically fucking sealed <laughs> he has demonstrated that he has no concept of reality and uh, yeah. holy crap what the hell has what the hell is wrong with the republican party right now how can he be polling it to at the top? This is absolutely insane. I would actually say this is more insane than Donald Trump polling at <laughs> the top. What the fuck? I don't know. I, I think it's just another perspective on crazy. I mean, yeah. Uh, Ben's just talking, talking himself up and belittling the president, whereas Trump just you know says bunches of racist and sexist things. Trump says a lot of, yeah, racist, sexist, and otherwise just bad things to say. Yeah. Ben Carson says a whole lot of things that are just straight up factually wrong. And stupid. I mean, so easy to fact check. It It's <laughs> definitely looking like he is a pathological liar. That's not somebody you want in a high pub. Yeah, it's not somebody you want in any public office, let alone president. Ah, oh, god damn. <laughs> and sticking with the, uh, you know, Adventists, the North American Division of the SDA Church has approved a new statement in their year-end meeting that finally acknowledges that sexual orientation is not a choice. Yeah. This was informed by science. Uh this is important since Adventists were among the first to push ex-gay therapy. Ooh. To maintain the condemnation and put it in theological language, they say that same-sex attraction is a byproduct of our fallen human nature. They reiterated that they believe that the only appropriate place for sex is with the confines of a marriage between one man and one woman, and that gay, lesbian, and bisexual church members may serve in leadership roles or be employed by the church, as long as they do not engage in any, and I quote, same-sex practice. In other words, gay men and lesbians must be celibate, and bisexuals must marry someone of the opposite sex. They direct that no church facilities or employees, including at Adventist colleges, may be used for any same-sex wedding or reception or any activities that promote any same-sex sexual activity, marriage, etc. They do, however, leave attendance of a same-sex wedding as a matter of personal conscience. They also advise hospitals to basically do as little as they can legally get away with in accommodating gays and lesbians and their legal right to get married. And believe it or not, this is progress. Well, I guess that's a good, it's a start, but... <laughs> it's a little bit of progress. They went an inch. So welcome to the 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> the early 90s. And yeah. 
this is also a it's it's basically a policy statement on how to handle you know running congregations like selecting people for office and how to run church business it is not a statement of belief or doctrine it is figuring out the best way they could to apply that that doctrine so it, it, interesting to see and uh, whether or not they will actually make any further progress and not to be outdone the mormon church has updated their handbook's list of acts of apostasy to include same-sex marriage this mandates church disciplinary action up to excommunication Hmm. Additionally, they have made it so that children of same-sex couples cannot go through any of the church ordinances, such as naming or baptism, or hold membership in the church. But they can join at the age of 18 if they've moved out of their parents' home and they disavow same-sex relationships. In other words, if they say their parents are horrible, sinful people, then they can, they can join the church. <laughs> Wow. Oh, goodness. Now, I definitely do think they need to do some tightening up of the whole naming practice. It's where babies get named in churches and put on the membership rolls. Actually, really, I think that just needs to be separated. Uh, I, Generally speaking, I don't really like the idea of, you know, government imposing anything on church membership, but it you should only get put on the rolls when you're an adult and you're able to actually consent to it. Nobody should be able to have church membership until they're 18. Yeah, I'm fine with that. And uh, moving on to Canada. Oh, eh? Canada's new prime minister filled his 31-member cabinet with a balance of men and women. He was actually asked why he did this, and his response is pretty awesome. It's Because it's awesome. 2015. Yeah, why not? And you know what? Every person in his cabinet deserves to be there. Mm-hmm. So, they were okay, all, why not? Uh, every single one of them has been elected to parliament. Uh, they have all demonstrated they are perfectly capable of those, those cabinet roles. And yeah, so e even some of the men yeah. have demonstrated that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what's also Let's very awesome, there. half of the cabinet, 16 in total, opted for secular solemn affirmations as opposed to the more traditional oath ending with, so help me God. Nice. 16 out of 31. That's a majority. Mm. That's pretty freaking awesome. Yep, yep, yep. Go Canada. Yeah, eh? And I think this is actually the, only the second time that we've had two stories that came from Canada in the same episode. Both good. So, yeah, go Canada. <laughs> and for our last story, 11 senior members of the Church of Scientology are facing charges of fraud, extortion, running a criminal organization, violating privacy laws, and practicing illegal medicine. If they are convicted, Scientology could be banned. If your book was listed as science fiction in the not-too-distant past, <laughs> <laughs> you, you might want to rethink it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, if your book was fiction from 2,000 years ago, you might want to rethink it. But still, I mean, come on. Yeah. This, this is an ass hat. I mean, it doesn't get any much any much more clearer than than this. Come on now, <laughs> Scientology, because like okay, the I, I personally consider the Roman Catholic Church to be the world's largest criminal organization. Uh, the way that they handle child molesters and just shuffle them around the world to avoid prosecution, but it's an incidental part of the organization. They are a church that happens to do a lot of illegal stuff. Scientology seems to be a criminal organization that calls itself a church that exists solely to extort money out of people. Well, okay, I guess that's not all that different than uh, the <laughs> prosperity gospel people. <laughs> but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens here. There, There is some uh, precedence. Uh, France uh, cracked down pretty hard on the Church of Scientology uh, going as far as possible without actually expelling the the organization. Of course, if they were to ban it, they could just change the name and start up again. And now for feedback. Mm. Uh, regarding, uh, I guess we'll be starting recent and moving backwards. Uh, so regarding episode 119 uh, from 
at Pixie Chixie 36 on Twitter. Oh, yeah. This episode of At Atheist Nomads will be hard to listen to. It'll bring up stuff from my life. Yeah, hey, it brought up a lot of stuff from my life, too. And then again, uh, uh, it was a hard, it was a great episode, but I did have to pause a few times to get my bearings mentally. Uh, not surprising. Uh, this was a, that was an episode that more than any other was going to be likely to hit hard, but that's a big part of why we needed to do it. Yeah. So you guys learned a lot of fucking dirt on me. I'll tell you what, I don't usually talk about that shit. So hooray or not. I don't know. Go, go be, be kind. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the whole point of it is, uh, uh, normalizing it. And the more people are open about what they struggle with, the, the better it will be for everyone. So thank you for, for, for listening to that episode and powering through. Uh, regarding episode 118 from at Gwen's Experience via Twitter, at Atheist Nomads, I lived in Toledo. People voted for her as a joke. This is uh, Opal Covey. Uh, <laughs> people voted for her as a joke in 2005. They actually put her on a TV debate that year. And then from Charles via email uh, regarding episode 117, I know I'm running a couple weeks behind. I blame life. Something that I have come to realize, and my roommate who has known me since college at PUC, at Pacific Union College, uh, Adventist School on the West Coast, uh, 25 years ago, is that uh, SDA almost killed me. I suffer from depression, anxiety, panic, paranoia, and SPD. Religion in general and SDA in specific aggravated these conditions to a point that I was under watch for long periods of time. When I left the church and religion, I came off my meds, and I am much more stable. Still weird as hell, surviving SDA with a high IQ, go figure. But I am now considered high-functioning. So what was said is very much the case. I have had, or I have slash had family who are preachers, elders, speakers, writers, etc. And no, most of them don't talk to me. Wow. Man. Yeah. Uh, Life sucks. I'm glad it, you're hanging in there, man. It does. Fuck. And, you know, being a, a bit older than me, I, I heard enough stories about what would have been going on or what was, what was going on in the Adventist church 25 years ago and earlier. And I don't know how anybody could have survived the Adventist church of the eighties without severe psychological trauma. Hmm. Love the, the hardcore legalism, the, just how judgmental everybody was and everything was, it does not sound like a nice place. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad you made it through. Uh, it was definitely a bit of a nicer church by the time I got, uh, by the time I was older, but still conservative religion can definitely play on, on people's problems and cause cracks if they aren't there already. Anyway, if any of you want to get in touch with us, you can always email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Call us at 541-203-0666. Hit us up on Twitter at Atheist Nomads or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. And please don't forget on these uh, lovely days leading up to Thanksgiving and the Christmas ooh, uh, to use our Amazon click through because you know what? It'll give us a couple bucks and we'll really appreciate it. And well, you'll be doing it good. Oh, and we want to thank our new platinum sponsor, George. Holy shit. George, 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 jung Georgia, the jungle. Look out for that tree. And oh. I did <coughs> finally update the, uh, sponsor supporter list on the website and in the show notes, uh, that had gotten way out of date. And I am very sorry to everyone that I had missed. Dude, uh, we, we did get much. We did get thank yous in, you know, in, in an episode, I believe for everyone. If we didn't, I am sorry. But now it's all updated on the, the website. Next week, we'll be back with an interview. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.